Greetings. I am Dr. Graciela Caneiro Livingston, Provost at Nebraska Wesleyan University. I want to welcome you to this year's presentation of Spooky Evenings. We here at Nebraska Wesleyan are excited and proud of this event that brings together scholars, artists, authors, and filmmakers to discuss the topic of horror in its various manifestations across the arts and the humanities. Professor Juan Jose Castaño Marquez and Dr. Matthew Jarvis have been working tirelessly to bring you the best scholarship in the field of horror through this unparalleled digital humanities event. I would like to acknowledge the generous support from the Nebraska Arts Council, Humanities Nebraska, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment that helps make quality programming like spooky evenings possible. Again, welcome and enjoy this presentation of Spooky Evenings. <laughs> Tonight on Spooky Evenings, Dr. Lawrence Rickles, Emeritus Faculty at UC Santa Barbara and author of The Vampire Lectures. And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to my guest, Dr. Lawrence Rickles. So glad you could join us, sir. Glad to be here. And you're, you're back in uh, California? I am. Um, Sporadically. I've been coming back for the last four years. <clears throat> I'm just for the season. Okay. But maybe I'll stay longer this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I came across you in graduate school, much to the chagrin of my film advisor and my obsession with horror movies. And uh, of course, your book, The Vampire Lectures, uh, which I uh, constantly cited. <laughs> When I would come talk about film theory with her uh, at, at her house, but uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And tonight we're going to spend some time with the undead and talk about uh, zombies, vampires, their relations and non-relations. Sounds good. Um, so I guess the best way to start the discussion is what distinction do you make at an entry level to define the difference between a zombie and a vampire? Well, <clears throat> um, I'd have to jump right into the theoretical dimension. For me, the understanding of the undead is based on the notion of two deaths, which is something that um, one finds sometimes in indigenous cultures, but Freud also wrote about it in Totem and Taboo. And it's the notion that after the first death, um, the dead person really isn't gone yet but lingers, malingers on as a ghost, but capable of all kinds of visitations. And then after about two years, however the period is set, um, the second death is celebrated. The body is dug up, exposed, and then reinterred, and that is the end. So uh, vampirism um, occupies uh, the cusp of the first death, struggling to postpone the second death. That's why the um, vampire stakings are so painful because there's so much at stake. Um, no one really wants the second death to happen. That's our investment in vampirism, I would argue, um, from the point of view of mourning theory. And um, in uh, zombieism, um, uh, again, you have a creature or a being, a human often who has already died 
um, but is now walking around um, inviting the second death, uh, asking um, to be part of the target practice that the zombie hunters are engaged in, um, constantly um, preparing, rehearsing, repeating um, the death of the dead. So this relationship to the two deaths, is this, uh, this is tied into the dual soul theory, yes? Um, um, tell me what that is. So in certain um, cultures, you have the idea of the wandering soul and the free soul, or yeah, the wandering soul and the free soul. And that would so, be another way to articulate it, but no, I, I meant literally a distinction between one death. I mean, in, in human terms, um, Freud calculated that the normal mourning process lasts about two years. And during those two years, one is constantly thinking about the dead, revisiting moments when shared with the dead. It is a very ghostly period. Um, and that is the period that vampirism really inhabits and tries to prolong. Um, and then eventually, you know, the dead really die when we forget about them and we are no longer um, involved, engaged, and even in uh, remembering them. And that's the second death, the real death. So that's that's what the in your your words and what the zombie is seeking the uh, forgetting. Yeah, the zombie is um, in, at the nihilistic end of things, asking to be uh, to get it over with already. <laughs> okay, that makes it's sense. To, I mean, to be forgotten. <laughs> well, because I mean, I'm also trying in this to like distinguish between other words we see pop up. Um, we see things like, like a ghost at a base level. Right. Uh, or, um, you know, in Night of the Living Dead, they're called ghouls. Um, and then, of course, you have things like revenants. So, so where do these fall in the spectrum of all this? And is, is there actually one that's more suited for an umbrella term for us to use instead of something like undead? Because undead is, I feel like, can branch off a lot of ways that these don't particularly fit into. Of course. Um, you know, in, at the European end of things, vampires, ghouls, uh, Rebinon, and so on are part of, um, you know, the forest of superstition. <clears throat> the distinction between zombieism and vampirism um, was an attempt at clarity that was brought about um, through um, American or New World science fictionalization of the vampire. So already in Night of the Living Dead, you see there's some talk about some Venus probe ricocheting and causing this uh, uh, epidemic. So um, uh, there's always a bit of science in um, the zombie epidemic versions. Um, there's always some motivation um, for um, this mass um, infection. And so the, a distinction comes to be drawn between the European vampire, I would say, and um, the American zombie epidemic. <laughs> <laughs> we could go so many directions, I feel like, right, right off that statement. Um, See it beautifully in the Jarmusch films. Were you familiar with those two? Mm -hmm. um, only Lovers, Left Alive or something. And um, the zombie one, there he really shows it quite beautifully, uh, the distinction. I think the, the vampires in the for earlier film even refer to um, humans as zombies because <laughs> this, this rapid turnover of, of into the second death, into oblivion, into complete nothingness, that's sort of the human condition from the vampiric point of view. <laughs> Uh, zombies and vampires also have different rules around them. I mean, the, rule, the rules are fluid in some ways, depending on where we exactly place them. But um, for instance, uh, zombies do not seem to be as affected by religious totems. Yeah, that's, there's, I've never seen any room made for that. <laughs> but what, why would that be? Is it a deterioration of the soul completely that's allowing for that, do you think? Or... It's a good question. Um, you know, there's something about zombieism, which has something to do with its new world science fictional habitat that brings it closer to secular horror. And by that, I mean slasher mm -hmm. movies, for example, that were going strong um, 
in parallel momentum with um, splatter movies that were often the zombie movies or there were any zombie movies in that category. And um, so there is in zombieism um, a, a focus on psychopathic violence at the same time that you really don't have in um, vampire fictions. But of course you have it big time in secular horror, less than occult horror. So I guess zombieism in general, um, it doesn't just move away from religion, it moves away from the occult, the superstition fringe of um, Western belief systems. You do, I, I, your point is well taken here in terms of particularly the classic American slasher. If we, we situate that, I guess, um, for the purposes of a conversation about zombies, Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, to some extent, Freddy Krueger as a ghost zombie. Uh -huh. Um, but very much a revenant with the face and thing. I mean, he, he actually appears manifest as what a revenant you would really think looking like. Right. Um, now I will say Michael Myers does transition by the sixth movie, uh, into the occult with a weird druid subplot. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the curse of Michael oh, I Myers. Do, I do. Well, you know, B culture is very fluid. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Especially definitely. when it goes into the franchise dimension or the serial dimension. Anyway, you have to come up with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, and I mean it. It is interesting. I mean, do you? So you do view those as sort of contemporary zombies? I do. I, I mean, they have something in common with one another, and if you look at the history of their popularity you see that they stand in a kind of shifting relationship to the popularity of the vampire that's parallel it's interesting because again i think the focus is on um uh the secular prospect of psychopathic violence um which is really ruled out of um vampirism i guess too uh when i think of particularly with jason Voorhees, and by the time i think you get to the fourth or fifth one he he very clearly is zombified, but in a very Frankenstein sort of way, uh, because he's electrified back into existence uh, by Tommy Jarvis, great last name. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess that bears the question too, in terms of Frankenstein, where do you situate Frankenstein's monster, Adam? Frank, I'm sorry, there's someone at the door. You went away. Okay, Frankenstein, <laughs> Frankenstein's monster, Adam. Yeah, where, do you situate that creature as a zombie as well? Well, he's not, he doesn't go into serial production. I mean, he does try to get a, a wife for himself. But the, um, the one of the reasons why um, Victor destroys the, the mate of the monster is because he's especially horrified at the idea that um, the creature could procreate. <laughs> and create What's interesting, I mean, you, you have, because you're talking about secularism, right? Um, if we think to the 31 version of Frankenstein, particularly, there are these questions that cause um, consternation and edits, right? There are these expurgated scenes from the 31 Frankenstein, most notably, uh, the, the when Victor Frankenstein brings the creature to life, comparing himself to God, right, right, uh, and then to your point uh, in, in terms of procreation, the m mistaken moment with the audience when Frankenstein is bringing the body of Maria, the young girl he accidentally drowns, back into the town. Audiences had believed that the monster had raped the right. young girl rather than drowned her. Right. So we we do see, I think, these two points that you're sort of like getting to. And that's why I'm wondering in terms of like an Americanization of Frankenstein, is he more right. zombified yeah. by being American? Yeah, no, I'm sorry about the interruption, by the way. But the, oh, you're fine. Um, the um, creature in Mary Shelley's novel, too, um, wants to get out of the melancholia plot and break free into something like zombieism. That's why the um, the monster is able to put himself or herself to rest at the end. But the plot itself, I mean, that's why I discuss um, Frankenstein and the vampire lectures. The crux of, of um, the relationship, I think, is when he says, when he realizes what his relationship entails to the monster and to all the killings of his family members performed by the monster, he says he sees at last 
the monster by the light of his inner vampire. So it's that inner vampirism um, or melancholia um, that rules everything seen from Victor's melancholic perspective, which is why I brought it into that particular book. But if you separate the creature from the creator, which is something American um, B culture probably would like to do and does, <laughs> then um, that is an open invitation to a zombie-esque treatment. I mean, that's already given in the novel, I think. No, I mean, I think that's, I mean, I don't know, it's something very 19th century about that too, I feel like in terms of the, the, the popular culture of the 19th century, wanting to be spooky and a deep fascination with undeath, especially as the century progresses, right? It just, it intensifies. Right. It, it doesn't really retreat. Um, in the early 19th century, they all had already discovered telegraphy. So, I mean, that is the, our only preoccupation um, technologically speaking and mass psychologically speaking, the uh, desire for direct or live connection. So yeah, it begins then. <laughs> well, I mean, you have whole cults around it, right? You think in art, right? Spirit photography, you think of um, on stage, you have uh, Phantasmagoria being performed in London. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, I mean, more directly in terms of, like you're going out, you're going to the Club Enfer in Paris, right? So there is this desire for connection with undeath in a, in a tangible way. And I guess in, unfair, consuming absence and making yourself into a type of zombie. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, um, oh, I thought I'd cut you off. I'm sorry. I no, I was um, waiting for you to finish. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I, I thought I'd cut you off. I apologize there. Um, so in terms of that uh, developmentally, because we do see Frankenstein in, toward the beginning of the 19th century, and we see Dracula emerge at the end of the 19th century uh, in 97 and Dracula in uh, 32. Um, did I just say this backwards? I think I may have. Frankenstein in 32, Dracula in 97. Uh, we do have the, the century bookended by undeath. Very different kinds of undeath. Um, it's true you jumped to the chase or cut to the chase and <laughs> saw the zombie um, aspect on the face of the monster in Frankenstein. That's that's very well put. But um, what's interesting about Dracula is that the mourning and melancholia themes are so dispersed. I mean, there are recent deaths in the backgrounds of all the vampire hunters but it's more like a, um, a tallying of, um, um, a tallying of uh, mortality in the lives of people in Britain on average. There's no um, sense of a, a, a real loss, except maybe with um, 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 you know, um, the vampire expert from Holland. Van Helsing. Thank you. <laughs> Van Helsing. <laughs> His, the loss of his son seems to be very compelling. But um, uh, it's uh, Stoker uses undeath to help understand um, the developing um, media sense around in his own society. So the vampire hunters um, basically uh, recollect themselves in the new possibilities of a media archive with all the devices um, that were already available in late 19th century Britain. And in the course of um, flushing or flushing out the uh, uh, vampire count, they discover that they have equipped themselves with counterparts to undeath that are perhaps more efficient than occult um, liminal states. So what's amazing about Stoker's Dracula is that it's a kind of um, uh, portrait of um, society undergoing media technologization. And that's what makes it um, more um, a prophetic really than even a cult or, or much of a horror book, I find. Um, so it makes me wonder then, do you see Dracula as a romanticist text? in this regard? 
No, I think it's, um, uh, there's romanticism between the lines that a lot of the film adaptations picked up on. Like um, one doesn't really know why he's a figure of endless grieving or why he's drawn to Lucy in particular, but then immediately adaptations bring in the notion of reincarnation, and he's found his long lost love and so on and so forth. That would be romantic. Mm. Um, but it's a very modern novel um, that of course, you know, still um, moves around in the bric-a-brac of uh, romanticism, um, but it's so, um, uh, what shall I say, um, so incredibly focused on the new gadgets mm. of um, Victorian England um, that it has that um, uh, sort of gadget loving um, aspect to it that I don't think one would has had ever found before in horror. No, I mean, because you, you, Kodak is name checked, right? And uh, Seward uses a phonograph instead of writing his journal down. And uh, Mina can type on a typewriter. Right. Um, but it is all the, uh, the so-called crew of light, right? Who deploy gadgetry versus the ancient Dracula. And that's where I see the romanticism because obviously Frankenstein is a, a romantic text. Right. And I guess the transition I'm trying to make here uh, with it too is is Dracula perhaps a um, a bridge of this uh, type of anti modernity uh, in a way in terms of horror to somebody like Lovecraft who whenever um, modernity is injected the horror becomes more unspeakable and unstoppable and even worse because it's ancient and it doesn't want to be disturbed by modernity right right. And you see that in, in Stoker's Dracula? I do. I mean, the reason I see it in there, and it might be because I've just been reading it over and over with my class, is that um, we don't know anything about, we don't get Dracula's side of anything, for one. Everything that would that be That would be the carefully crafted nostalgia, because there's so little of his voice. Uh, one letter. <laughs> yeah. No, but there's, he's kept very much out of the very loud modernity of the book. I mean, it's all the, the voice and screed of this um, archive of the vampire hunters. Um, he's, so I'd say by some kind of negative theology, say, maybe, yes, the romantic um, occult figure is preserved, but he's hardly represented. Oh, sure. I mean, I guess the one, the one injection is that he, Harker documents him as saying, um, to live in a new house would kill me. Right. No, there's... And I think that I think that's literal. <laughs> <laughs> it probably is. You know, it's like oh, drywalling. <laughs> uh, I also find Dracula to be the funniest character ever if you actually just think about him. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking the other night about Dracula and his label maker because all the keys have labels on them, and I just <laughs> what, what he is up to in his, his free time is just kind of hysterically funny to me. Right. Yeah. Um, not a whole so, lot to do. The, the phrase that keeps coming out of Dracula, um, and you make some mention of in vampire lectures, and people have countlessly named things this, is, of course, the blood is the life, which is a, a misquote from uh, the Bible. I think the real phrase here should be, for both zombies and vampires, the dirt is the life. Okay, why? So they're both buried, right? Um, by and large. Um, but in, in Dracula, I mean, he, you know, he, he requires the dirt of his homeland, right? Well, that's um, true. Yes, he has to take that with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting. Do you watch um, What We Do in the Shadows, the television series? I haven't seen that. Though. They had a recent episode where they actually have to bring the dirt of their homeland with them. They have little baggies because they go to Las Vegas. No, they go to Atlantic City and they have a little baggie of dirt that they put under their bed and of course it's a comedy so the maid vacuums it up um but i'm, I'm curious you know in relationship to this and uh, an idea of like nationalism particularly with vampires is that just a giant metaphor because we we've come to the point where we think of the again americanization through Anne rice of the, the coffin right. but it's not the coffin by and large traditionally it's dirt yeah 
And how does that relate to the zombie? Well, because the, the zombie does, uh, is also sort of like at home in its grave, right? It is, it, it comes from its grave. And a lot of times you see it returned to its grave um, or compelled toward its grave in different iterations, uh, mm-hmm. unless it's destroyed. <laughs> now, I've not seen that. You know, I might not have seen as much um, zombie fiction as you have, but I seem to recall that they go to the shopping center and stuff like that. Well, they do, they do that too. <laughs> but I mean, they... they, they they, they sort of, there's different, if they make it back from the shopping center. <laughs> but the, uh, um, the business about the dirt, um, the little bit of um, sacred burying, burial um, earth that um, Count Dracula anyway needs to have with them. That might even be an innovation of Stoker's, do you know? I mm-hmm. can't remember. But anyway, I would read that too because it's kind of a, more a vestigial souvenir than anything else as um, the uh, interesting proximity between the vampire and early photography. Okay. And photography was you know, thought of as indexical originally as developing a vestige, perhaps a bit of earth. And um, you know, the vampire who can't be photographed, who can't see himself in the mirror um, is a walking index. And, you know, something that can be seen because he carries a bit of earth on him. <laughs> so I would I would credit that to um, Stoker's incredible immersion in um, the new media devices at that time. Okay. Now, do you see the lack of reflection in vampires to be this problem with the soul? Do you agree with that theory? God knows that um, it echoes that sort of thing. Um, I think it emphasizes the absolute novelty of the vampire as image, okay. um, a kind of sheer image that can't be caught by a, um, a mirror um, that um, um, in a sense anticipates the, the real um, fluorescence of uh, the vampire legend on screen. I mean, the, the vampires in literature, especially in Stoker, are pressing towards um, the screen um, um, as the only place where this uh, new image can be seen, an image without a mirror. Well, it's fascinating too. I mean, if you think to, I guess, the, the, the juxtaposition between the idea of a vampire can't be photographed, but then also something like... Um, Shadow of the Vampire, where the vampire is obsessed with being photographed. Right. right. Um, or even in, Anne Rice, in the film version of Anne Rice's interview with the vampire, them going to the cinema, or even in uh, Coppola's, right? He goes to the cinematographic to uh, watch stag films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I thought, I mean, we're talking about this now because of that bit of earth you mentioned. Yep. And that I just think is, I see that as the vestige that was an important part of the imagining of photography, early photography. How, how does it work around constructs around um, Christian ideals that are placed as things that stave off the vampire though? Because the, the vampire can live in consecrated dirt but can't touch the host, for instance. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, what can I say? I mean, the, the vampire, like so many allegories, is um, caught between um, old traditions and um, new functions. So he's sort of a, on the cusp of secularization. Um, but he has to, in his image, his modern image, has to use the bric-a-brac of religion to um, you know, orient himself or orient the readership, someone who gets oriented when the cross goes up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I, you talk about it in your book, and uh, Dragan has talked to us about it too. The idea from uh, the, the Polanski fearless vampire killers, right? The Jewish vampire, just like, oh, it's not going to work. Here. <laughs> now, Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all, all pardons for my dialect work there. Um, but, you know, it, it is interesting to think because it's, it's, it's sort of 
the vampires just endlessly linked to a type of tradition is that what's going on here and they're just sort of like as you put it sort of like nostalgic for that tradition um i don't know if maybe nostalgic for that tradition is all right but i'm trying to say is that what we observe in the transitional phase of secularization um, is that as we try to steer clear of over-reliance on religion, for example, um, in order that we um, not just end up um, with our own deaths, in other words, and getting our groove back um, through secularization, we don't want to just end up in the grave. Mm -hmm. So we find other ways in which to imagine um, something that's more than lifetime. Um, I would say the whole um, occult horror uh, literary tradition is part of that. Um, the absolute need to imagine that um, there's something um, that's a little more than lifetime. Now, whether psychoanalysis steps in and talks about the two deaths or mourning or memory, it kind of doesn't matter. The point is we're all like the vampire trying to um, extend the waiting and passage time between the two deaths. And we want there to be already that there are two deaths is more than lifetime. <laughs> that there is mourning is already more than lifetime. Um, but it, the secular mind is unwilling to make the leap of faith that uh, I guess was comforting in the past and has to find in the bric-a-brac um, of the collapsed systems um, and among the superstitions that attend those systems has to find a new guidance system and a, a new way of projecting life beyond lifetime. Well, so, I mean, it's fascinating too, because if you think about it in terms of um, particularly Christianity, right? Thinking of immortality in relationship to it, right? You, one of the signifiers is that the Eucharist, right? But in vampirism and only in vampirism, they get bifurcated, right? Because Dracula probably isn't going to care about the blood of Christ being sacred, right? Uh -huh. It never comes up. You don't see them. It's always holy water. It's not that part of the Eucharist, which I find really fascinating, uh, particularly in terms of this idea of like taboo and a tradition around taboo. Because, you know, if you go back all the way to the middle ages and you look at like cycle plays and things right they steal both they do horrible things to both like right. they, they transgress against the entirety of the eucharist but the vampire for some reason is able to wedge them apart right well again he has um uh, the, that greater flexibility that i was trying to evoke as a sec as a figure that's kind of borderline secular i mean a good point of comparison is the devil or anything within the precincts of devil fiction, um, uh, the, the uh, vampire is ruled out as an immortality neurotic <laughs> in the <laughs> context of um, belief in the devil. And the devil um, uh, rigorously doesn't grant immortality, but he grants you quality time, which, which means time that's not interrupted by poverty or illness. Um, and as a um, as a substitute for immortality, uh, he offers the certainty that you will die in 24 years. Mm -hmm. So that kind of certainty is, is a secular alternative to immortality. <laughs> In exchange for something, though, right? I mean, back to the soul again, right? Right, right, right. And there all the, the Christian um, baggage still works, of course. I'm just offering this as, as a a point of comparison to the vampire where none of the religious imagery really works. I mean, yes, there are wounds and blemishes and problems, but it's it doesn't balance out as a, a systematic um, aspect of the vampire. So I want to like, transport the vampire and isolate it uh, just in America and the zombie actually uh, just in America for a moment here. Um, 
I think it's safe to say that the Broadway play and film adaptation of it, of the Bela Lugosi Dracula is the Americanization of the vampire is then the following year with white zombie with again, Bela Lugosi, uh, a type of Americanization of the zombie, um, which is actually in terms of where the zombie will go by the mid 20th century, more traditional going back to like Yoruba tradition um, or um, do we think that perhaps the zombie uh, has sort of like more efficacy in American culture as in some ways this uh, latent cultural guilt about the middle passage and the slave trade and things and its legacies um, or do we just totally go science fiction with it <laughs> I would go science fiction in terms of the real time of its development. I'm cert I certainly appreciate any um, um, attempts to um, cycle back through zombieism in order to address the history of slavery. That's very important, of course. But um, I don't see that as the driving force, especially when we talk about the relationship between vampirism and zombieism. I think it's, as I've already said, the, the um, preeminence of science fiction in the American imaginary. Um, as a follow-up to that, I've, I've been working with a German philosopher named uh, Gotthard Günther, who wrote in, uh, while he was in exile in the States, um, wrote a, a good deal about science fiction. And um, he argues that um, uh, in the new world, which for him is the, um, uh, the platform for flying off into outer space. In other words, all the talk about frontiers means that the final frontier is what's next. And the uh, uh, people in the new world are struck um, by the fabulous prospect of reaching outer space, but are also stuck in a kind of, um, um, heap of disowned traditions, no longer working traditions, just kind of waiting around <laughs> for the, um, the transport. Um, and anyway, he argues that uh, the, uh, the new world as it faces the prospect of outer space transport is inevitably going to develop a new metaphysics. And for a new metaphysics, you need a, a viable experience of anguish and pain and zombieism, he says at one point, which for him is the double of um, um, computer intelligence, that these two prongs of undeath are, um, define the suffering that the new world has to undergo in order to reach a new metaphysics. So what does that suffering consist of? It consists again of both the acceptance of the two deaths and the second death coming soon and um, a commitment to carry it out. Um, as I said, the zombie uh, really functions as, a, as target practice for carrying out um, the um, death verdict against the dead. Um, those that are dead, but um, aren't completely dead, have to be put to rest. So um, that I think is, um, uh, for me, that's the foundation of zombieism in its relationship to science fiction. Because uh, um, zombieism is probably, it has to be older than science fiction. Um, but, and the science fiction details are almost as um, discreet and strewn about as the details of religion and vampirism. Um, so it's really the, um, this um, scenario that I just tried to evoke of using zombieism as a protection or as a, a preparation for the abandonment of the earth and the um, move to, to outer space. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pause the outer space point for a second i mean we uh probably the most notable with zombies in outer space of course is plan nine from outer space uh right we're gonna take over the world by creating zombies so kind of an inversion of that but well that's like, like solaris uh, the um 
they communicate with us by bringing back our dead. That's the, also the Solaris paradox that the, the star that no one can understand <laughs> tries to communicate uh, with us by uh, realizing or fulfilling our wishes over and against our losses. And, and, and Bruegel prints as well. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason why not um I, I have a freshman who was asking me about that the other day and i was just like you've watched solaris <laughs> come with me young one <laughs> um the ultimate marriage of science fiction and uh sort of like traditional zombieism to me is the um the 1988 west craven serpent and the rainbow based on the 85 Wade Davis right. book, because I mean, we're, we're looking for a medical drug, right? Uh, and that, that's the sort of impetus for his going to uh, Haiti. Um, but then of course we get the, 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 uh, the horrific plot line that it actually starts with, right? Cause we get the one guy being buried and we see the tears running down his face. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that particular adaptation or the, the, the film or the book. Um, like I said, I, I um, you know, respect that uh, interest in the historical and maybe theological import of um, voodoo, for example. But um, I just don't know enough about it. Sure. That's fair. <laughs> That's a fair answer. <laughs> um, you do get points to uh, return to this, again, very American version. Uh, I'm talking to Clay McLeod Chapman soon about horror comics and apart from the walking dead which of course is sort of like perennial and like as a tv series won't die um you had the strain as well where the vampires are very zombie-esque um because it's it's a lot of things about like uh the way it's transmitted and sort of like the the over carnivorousness of um a type of vampirism uh, that I think is this new, uh, I don't know. It, it, I link this all like postmodern horror, which for me starts at Scream and is everything else after. Um, but it's this, this effort to change the rules around everything uh, and mush them up and muddy them in order to try to be innovative. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's um, dictated by the culture industry. I mean, when you, pitch a topic you say this meets that so you're always mixing things up yeah <laughs> you have to, to cover, well, just... cover your ground but there's still a logic to all of that that's our job to follow out the logic anyway i remember when i was um i mean i've written about this that um, i noticed that a lot of people who were vampire fans were really offended by carpenters vampires and there too the vampires are sort of uh, clans of psychopathic killers um, and that's when I realized how that is a, a real distinction maybe it's within uh, vampire readership or horror understanding but a distinction between the drip 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 of blood sucking <laughs> and turning people into uh, gadgets um, for further communication and that ravenous you know killing um, that um, is more closely allied with the, the zombie. Do you see? Do you see the vampire or the zombie as the the better mirror for a biopolitical representation? That's a hard, really hard question. I think you have to work with them together. Oddly enough, um, as I've tried to do, somehow the the differences and overlaps. Um, add up to a working allegory. Um, I don't think one is enough. Sure. Well, it's interesting one. to me because we see the werewolf interjected into here too, because the werewolf becomes the enslaved more often than not, right? And you would think that it would traditionally, again, I, I know you're rejecting my historical read of the zombie, but in, in this paradigm, you would think it would be the zombie that would fulfill that for the vampire in a legacy so, which will fill what the, the werewolf's but, role as servant right but um 
I don't know of any vampire fiction where zombies are used as um, servants, however. But no, I don't. Can... I don't either. That's why I'm curious as yeah. to why. I, I, why, why the living creature that also can return to the state of of man is this like a, I mean, it's a theme know, Rousseauian walking, moment? <laughs> it's a theme in The Walking Dead, isn't it? I mean, I haven't seen all the shows, but every once in a while, some psycho leader um, tries to um, make government and all sorts of things out of the condition of undeath or living death. Um, so that, you know, becomes an allegorical, I guess political situations but the um the zombies themselves are so um debilitated because they're so dead and on the and they're not deluded about it <laughs> they're on their way to the second death that i mean the closest we can come to an allegory which is already given in the um, voodoo situation is the um use of a post-traumatic stress disorder or people or shell shock victims. I mean, whole armies of people like that and pressing them into the service of um, some kind of power, pull or push. I mean, it, uh, zombies are often armies and they could easily stand in for the condition of soldiers since World War I. Absolutely. <laughs> um, do, I, I'm curious as to why you think the, the zombie then is um, by and large, if I, I, I may just not know an example, but they're usually unintelligent. They are. Um, again, depending how we want to read Frankenstein, that could be our exception here. Um, be a big exception, <laughs> or, or or Freddy Krueger even, because uh, he is articulate, but um, and even witty, but. They, they, they seem to have a lot less mental capacity than, say, a vampire. Though, in Dracula, Van Helsing does refer to Dracula as having a child brain that has mm -hmm. degenerated back to a child brain. Because at once he was this great academic who studied it. Uh, it's growing. Van Helsing warns the group. Yeah, right. Older, why they're in such a hurry. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, that uh, Dracula has a lot of free time and they don't. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Time is on his side. But um, remember in um, Dawn of the Dead, no, Day of the Dead, I'm sorry, um, where Romero has that one um, gifted zombie, Bob, who is slowly <laughs> learning to speak or listen to music, to really do all the things that the protagonist of... Um, um, I am legend has to do to survive. Um, he too is acquiring all those skills and even mourns his, um, his uh, uh, killed um, doctor father <laughs> at the end of the film. So I think in, um, I mean, that's obviously just one of many ways in which to intervene in the zombie fiction, but I think it makes sense that you would see that as some kind of living end from where one has to start over from scratch. Um, not necessarily as a, a, a new species, but as a species somehow cleansed through this um, a catastrophe. Um, that doubles the other theme that Romero um, keeps on um, pursuing, at least in the first, in the second and third films. And that is, um, uh, um, determining who um, is qualified to survive the zombie invasion. So, um, you know, racists have to die, sexists have to die. It's really a kind of super, um, you know, red brigade <laughs> hit list of the people who are not allowed into the future. So on the one hand, the zombie himself is someone who might start from scratch a new beginning, and zombieism as an excuse to test one's own merits um, for going into the survival species. So, I mean, as a, as a student of Freud, I would say of you, uh, as a lifelong, yeah. uh, maybe disciple is better, but I don't know. You, 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 you choose the noun here. Um, <laughs> Zombies are the bottom of the uncanny valley, right? It's the most sort of like rejectable thing. 
but should there be like a lower <laughs> for Bob? Does Bob like the the zombie that is now learning? Is that somehow more uncanny and more disturbing, or is it <laughs> unthinking zombie? Which is it? Which is the more uncanny, and why? Um, I don't find Bob uncanny. I think <laughs> he's moving, <laughs> but um, um, look. Uh, the thing about zombie pictures, for example, is you have to keep on watching them. They don't really stay with you. That's why it itself has a kind of epidemic momentum to it whenever zombies are in at the movie theater. Um, because the, um, the turnover and the fantasy is relatively limited. Um, I've, I've tried to reduce it now to the two deaths, but you can call it something else. But. <laughs> I mean, you're you're the guest. Especially, I'm just especially the... if you're applying a topical allegory, a political allegory. Romero was very good at using zombieism to allegorize the specific social situation of a decade, which is pretty extraordinary. So, but once you're in the limited uh, realm of topical allegory, there's not too much you can really develop, and you just have to keep on returning to it, mm. um, which is, in a way, also zombified. <laughs> <laughs> right, we we ourselves become it, right? Or like we should be like the watchers of the undead, or something, uh, as a type of zombie. The other thing here that's rather striking to me is sexuality in these beings. Right, the the vampire gets to be sexy, whether it be Bella Lugosi, whether it be Frank Langella on stage, whether it be Christopher Lee or Gerard Butler, more recently in Dracula two thousand, um, but very rarely unless it's a comedy <laughs> is there a sexy zombie there there is no um fetishization of the there zombie, actually is a lot of um, which would be like yeah. a, a weirdly ultimate taboo i guess is the not just like desecration of the dead body but the rottingly dead body but they do use zombieism in pornography which is interesting that um, um zombieism would go there whereas uh, vampirism is sort of more erotic. <laughs> but um, something about making the, the entire body totally exposed to intervention and destruction is for some people a turn on. Of course, it doesn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, we talked about this a little bit before we went on air of all things, right? We talked about you know, Jeffrey Dahmer, of course, most famously made right. zombies out of people, or wanted to by pouring battery acid into their... Well, he wanted that to last a little longer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess until until he got nibbly. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is rather fascinating. And just this, this, that is a very niche fetish, right? The... The, the fetishization of the decomposing zombie or zombified body versus, you know, because they're both undead. We classify them both as undead. So they're both corpses, but yet there is a much more common erotics that we've seen culturally, not even just filmically, right? It, particularly the eighties and nineties, right? You had all these murders around uh, people convincing them that they were vampires and things. Um, tied up in the satanic panic of the time but it is odd and we we think of the vampire itself in this way particularly the male vampire um, well, remember and, stoker introduced the notion that um you had to invite the vampire into the household and that notion of invitation is really a psychoanalytic understanding of desire and denial so um it, really we owe a great deal of that to stoker to his um staging of um, the complicity or seeming non-complicity between the vampire and the vampiroid. Well, that's fascinating too, because of course it's like, you have the implication that Lucy, Lucy Westerner invites Dracula in. Of course it's Renfield who invites him into Carfax Abbey. And then you have this, the, the, basically the rape scene of uh, Mina Harker. Right. Um, so that you do have those uh, different uh, dualities, even as sort of like uh, the possibilities of uh, of that sort of like notion. Well, there has to be an invitation somewhere in the economy or oikos in the household. I mean, once you're in Carfax Abbey, then the whole thing is the oikos. So that's why Renfield can be the one who invites. But when you're one-on-one, -on -one, the vampiroid is inviting. 
uh, vampire. That's um, Stoker's understanding. And I mean, it's even inverted too with Jonathan, right? The, the moment he crosses the threshold to come in, right? Uh, like, Don't and, sleep anywhere else in the castle. Right? <laughs> and then he goes there. Like a little. Well, he, I mean, it's like in a horror <laughs> movie, like an 80s horror movie when the string violins start coming in, you know, it's like you're going the wrong way in the woods. The string <laughs> section is fired up, you know, he ignores so much. I mean, even well, before, I think this is one of the wonderful things in the, the Mel Brooks, right? Dracula dead and loving it. It's like, how are you ignoring these people? They're like straight out of, uh, out of Friday the 13th. The guy going, it's a death curse. You know, and, <laughs> Like here, they're all giving you crucifixes and <laughs> different things and telling you you're going into hell and you're like finding out the translation of the things in your dictionary <laughs> that you're going to meet Satan. Like, I don't know how many more warnings Jonathan Harker could have gotten. Right. Uh, and then, you know, Dracula also tells him, leave some of the happiness you bring behind. <laughs> Like that's like right out of Dante, right? That's that's uh, abandon hope, all ye who enter here, right? Absolutely. And so you, you just have to wonder at that <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> oh man, um, so I we jumped were, around we a talk, lot. We were, talking about, we were talking about the seductiveness of yeah, vampire. the seductive vampire versus the non the, non sexy zombie. Of <laughs> zombieism. <laughs> No, no offense to anyone who's got a sexy zombie costume plan for Halloween, but <laughs> I, I, I just, I have to wonder that. I mean, particularly on film, though, you see that as represent. I mean, they go out of their way, and I really think to particularly Anne Rice and interview with. I know Anne Rice did not want Tom Cruise, but then she gave him her blessing after she saw the movie. Oh, he was. That's uh, the best role he's ever played. Uh, the sexist guy in Magnolia that he oh, plays. I didn't see um, <laughs> I recommend it. Uh, it's not a light movie, but it is the best Tom Cruise role in film, in my opinion. Yeah, it's um, an astonishingly good job. <laughs> well, I mean, it's interesting too because uh, both Coppola and uh, for uh, Interview with the Vampire, they both wanted um, Daniel Day Lewis. Oh, okay. I forgot. Uh, and, yeah. Instead, he was doing a different kind of vampiric role in The Unbearable Lightness of Being. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and so it, it is interesting to see that uh, sort of like play out. I am driving Siri crazy tonight with these <laughs> questions. She's like popping up in my sidebar. Um, the um, the um, seductiveness of the vampire and rice, though, is quite different because it's about the thrill the vampire feels this was the first time we entered the vampire remember we talked about how he was really just an empty place and in, in in dracula mm -hmm. um you know a kind of placeholder for another tradition perhaps i think you were wanting to argue and i agree but um <laughs> but in in rice that was her real innovation is that she invited us to um enter the enter vampirism and um, even enjoy the sensations of um, you know, everything a vampire does. She, however, I, mean, I, would have, I would have to be an annoying Freudian, however, to point out just the same, that how she catches us, whether we know it or not, is that the vampires that we've now entered are, um, uh, should I say that they're threatened by uh, su suicidal thoughts. Oh yeah. So the, it's the sui suicide, suicidality of the vampire in facing um, immortality, which means facing the endless loss of someone, as she even puts it in an interview. That's what I think grabs us, um, even as we're enjoying all the sensations of being vampires. No, I mean, Louis definitely needs to go into analysis, right? <laughs> he has a <laughs> lot of hangups here. Um, and you get, I mean, you, I forget the, the little girl's name. You have, I mean, a super both Greek and Freudian moment with her as vampire. Right. Um, it makes me think of um, the myth of Endymion, just this idea of like an eternal being, but perpetually youthful. Um, and sort of like should not be touched, right? Forbidden. 
uh, in relationship to that. And you get, I mean, you see that more in comedy again than you see it in a, a dramatization. You see what in comedy, I'm sorry? The idea of the uh, silly young vampire, right? Oh, right. Uh, you, you get it occasionally. We were talking about um, Let the Right One In, of course, the young girl who is um, fetishized by an older mortal man. Right. Um, and that's very dramatic. But the love story is between an actual youthful child and this who knows how old uh-huh. uh, vampire that appears as a young girl. But that's 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 more of the rare side. You see it as a joke of like the the, the vampire, uh, the, the the vampire as a child. Well, one of the training camps for horror entertainment, the Grand Guignol in Paris, always alternated between comedy and horror. In horror of the you know bloodthirsty kind and and all kinds of comic relief. Um, you see that even in a lot of slasher films, especially the earlier ones, often to come full circle because as, like in the case of Wes Craven, he had come from making porno. Hmm. A lot of comedy. Coppola too. The 70s. <laughs> Everybody forgets that. Coppola's first two movies were pornography. There you go. Oh, I just remembered Wes Craven. <laughs> uh, and uh, Roger Ebert. Roger, Roger Ebert wrote uh, pornographic scripts. Wow, in the days when they had scripts. <laughs> he, uh, well, because in his review of Caligula, he makes reference to the fact that he used to, and he calls it, uh, he re uh, his review of Caligula says, it's not even good porn. <laughs> um, I guess too, I, I just want to finish up on this, this thread of children as a site of taboo. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm going to return it to zombies in this case uh, and end it on Pet Cemetery. And the idea of, again, the dirt, or as I was saying, the replacement of the blood is the life, the dirt is the life, which in Pet Cemetery is quite true. Um, and sort of like this, this incantation in terms of like, uh, I guess going off of what you've said throughout, that the idea of the zombie is to forget and to move on from, to shoot. Uh, but I think in the body of the child, we find the exception that makes the rule. Well, that, <clears throat> you know, in, in my work, since my first book, I've been um, uh, taking into consideration the history of childhood and the setting of all these different histories, the history of technologization and so on and so forth. And um, in some in many cultures, childhood really does not exist as an institution until literacy um, is established as um, a social norm, um, which means that um, childhood came into existence probably in the 18th century in many European countries at a time, however, when childhood mortality was still very, very high. And whereas before um, little one you know, was ditched and replaced with a newborn bearing the same name or what have you. Once you have literacy, once you have the invention of childhood, once the child has a name that goes on a gravestone, that child has to be mourned and is probably unmournable. So I see the death cult of childhood at its um, invention, at its inception, as one of the primal scenes of horror. I, I, I think that's definitely true. And I mean, I think that's why they're so rejective. I mean, you know, like that's why Halloween is so effective at, at its start, right? Because he's both living and dead at the beginning. He, and then the way that uh, Donald Pleasance insisted on Dr. Loomis being as this uh, creation of the, not giving him sort of like more than just being dead and something else. Mm -hmm. right and then he should be uncanny and masked because we we can't engage with him in any way right because he died in that moment and we watched it we were him we were his eyes in that moment yeah absolutely so um thank you so much i i've thoroughly enjoyed this i could probably spend more of the evening than you have to give me uh <laughs> talking on this topic uh, i invite everybody to take the survey that Juan is placing in the chat right now i also invite you to tune in tomorrow night for uh dr joseph laycock's talk and as always stay spooky <laughs>
Okay, thank you so much. Are we off now? Uh, we are, the credits are rolling over us. Okay. Uh, so that, that, I will thank you be. for a good time and no, it's, it's wish you well great. with the program. Sorry? Wish you well with your program. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored that you could uh, be part of it. And uh, no, I definitely, I, I will now think of zombies a little bit differently. Uh, probably better. <laughs> okay, well, thanks again. Um, if you could just hang out for just a few minutes. Oh, I'm hanging gonna... out, sorry. Yeah, no, we're, we're, we're going to come back and uh, take a selfie with you as well. Oh, that's right, the selfie. I, I know, social media and all that. <laughs> Speaking of zombiehood. Being... Now, if you want me to advertise any of this on Facebook or what have you, um, send me something. Sure, definitely. Uh, we can send you yourself. <laughs> um <laughs> But I mean, you must have a link to the. Um... Oh yeah, we will. I'll be able to send you all kinds of stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we generate a lot of media over here. Good for you. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's uh, yeah, I, I really hadn't thought too much about the zombie and the idea of the ultimate stage of completing mourning to, com to, to the last part of forgetting, and that's I think really nicely put because of course ghosts are the opposite, right? Ghosts are the never being able to forget well that's what we project into them because we hope sure. they forget <laughs> yeah well I, th I was just re-watching the changeling the other night and I just uh -huh. the, the obsession with not forgetting right, right. so um, we are I think one is about to pop on here we just went to 